Uh, I'm Kevin Fleming. I work for Bloomberg in New York City and also in London and wherever else they send me. Um, so I was going to ask some of the questions Karen just asked. So first of all, how many people here do not know what a corporate contributor license agreement is? Don't be shy. Raise your hand if you don't know. Would you like? Okay, there's enough I could tell you. So there are some open source projects that when you want to contribute to them, in addition to whatever open source license the code is distributed under, which of course your code is a derivative of, also require you to sign an additional agreement, which could be for a variety of reasons. We're not going to go into the many reasons why those exist, because that would be a day-long discussion on its own. But this talk is about the practicalities of being a large company, which I work for a large company, and wanting our developers to be able to contribute to those projects and having to deal with the mechanics of doing this, that sort of thing. Um, you've probably all experienced, if you've ever contributed to an open source project, the wide varieties of ways they accept patches, and then the way they do code reviews, and the way they discuss code, and all those kinds of things. And you would prefer, of course, a simple, easy to navigate process what I'm going to talk about here is I would prefer a simple, easy to navigate process when one of our developers wants to contribute to one of these projects. So I'll make sure I try to get these slides in a reasonable place. So uh, I have been contributing to um, open source software for a very long time. Uh, we'll not say how long because you know how old I was. Um, I have run projects. I've actually been on both sides of this equation. So I, I used to run a project that used a contributor license agreement, and which it still does. Now I'm on the other side. I work for a company that produces open source software as a small part of what we do. Our primary business is commercial software and data services. Um, but we use open source software heavily. And so we end up, of course, contributing to those projects. So the ubiquitous slide for this room, I'm not a lawyer, not your lawyer, don't play a lawyer on TV. If you take any of this as legal advice, you're entirely on your own. So, and unfortunately, because I couldn't use the, uh, the slides in my original form, I didn't get to have these lines show up as I press the button. So you get to see the answers to the questions before I get to ask them. This was going to be the, quest the, the softball question for Richard to answer because he's the one who would have answered this. So as you might imagine, when someone comes to us and wants to contribute to an open source project, the simplest option is when that project doesn't require any contributor license agreement at all. We can just go look at what open source license is distributed under, look for any other interesting potential caveats that might be associated with that project, and then say, go ahead. You're all set. There are some projects who, who don't want to go to the extent of having a contributor license agreement, which is great, but they still want each contribution that comes to the project to have some explicit acknowledgment of the fact that, yes, I do intend to give this to the project. And so some time ago, I don't remember how many years now, I'm sure someone in the room can tell me, this thing called the Developer Certificate of Origin was created, which is a very straightforward attempt to solve that problem. It basically requires, it basically is a very small process that the developer can use to say, yes, I am giving this contribution to the project, and I certify that it's either my work or that I have permission to give it to you under the terms of the license that the project uses. It would be wonderful in the ideal fantasy world if that was the end of this. If we did not have to do individual contractual agreements to contribute to some projects. Unfortunately, many projects have been told by their attorneys or others that they do need to have them, so we have to deal with this. So, this is unfortunate because I would have had to, uh, been able to go through this much more easily. But in our company, and which is probably true in many large companies, there are going to be at least four people involved when an employee wants to begin contributing work that they've done at the company. So it's property that belongs to the company, not something they did on their own spare time or on their own computer or whatever. And they want to contribute that to an open source project. And that open source project requires a contrib contributor license agreement to be signed. Obviously, you've got the developer that wrote the code in the first place. You have someone from the company's legal team, because this is a legal agreement that the company is going to be signing. It gives permission in some, to some greater or lesser degree for this project to use intellectual property that was created and owned by the company. So obviously, the company's legal team, whether that's internal or external counsel, is going to want to review that agreement. Then, of course, you're going to have to have someone in the company who has the authority to sign agreements giving away the intellectual property of the company. That's not a trivial thing. 
This is very different from signing an agreement that says, yes, we will buy 10,000 t-shirts a month for the next three years. I mean, most of us wouldn't sign an agreement like that either because we don't want 10,000 t-shirts a month. But for a company to make a purchasing contract is a relatively trivial thing. And lots of people inside a company will have permission to do that sort of thing. But as you might imagine, um, if they're hiring people, for example, and a potential employee wants to negotiate their employment agreement, if the company uses employment agreements and wants to make changes to those, permission to negotiate those and then the authority to sign that is not something that's doled out to tens, hundreds of people or even tens of people. It's usually a handful of people. And the same is true when any agreement involving the company's intellectual property is in place. So this will tend to be um, a very high level executive. It may be the company's general counsel, in which case we can actually skip having four people here and only have three. And then you're going to have a person like me who has to navigate these waters and figure out exactly what process needs to be done, who needs to be brought in, where are the pitfalls so they can make sure that nobody makes a mistake that could be damaging down the road, et cetera. And that is because, of course, the developer is a developer. They don't have the knowledge of understanding what a CCLA looks like and what its terms might mean. And the attorney, as good as many of them are, especially many that are probably in this room, they aren't particularly familiar with open source software and license agreements and software development in general, and they could use some guidance on how the terms that they're seeing in this agreement may apply to the work that's being done. So the first step, of course, is the developer, Alice's dutiful developer that follows all the company policies at her company where she works, and she knows immediately before she tries to send any code to an open source project that she's supposed to get permission, right? That's what all developers at every company in the world do, right? Everybody's nodding their heads. Yes, of course, that's not what happens. But anyway, let's assume, of course, that that's what happened. And so Alice does the right thing, and she makes a request however that's supposed to be done. Email, phone call, instant message, some sort of ticketing system, which is what we use, something like that. That's going to get routed to the person who gets to decide how this is going to proceed. That's me in our company. So for me to be able to process Alice's request, obviously, I'm going to have to go learn about this project. And the first thing I'm going to learn is, yeah, their contributing file in their GitHub repository or wherever else they post their code says that, in fact, to contribute to their project, you have to sign a contributor license agreement. Might be individual, might be corporate. Usually, it's both. If either exists, you would expect the other to exist as well. So what am I going to need to be able to make these decisions? Well, obviously, I'm going to have to be able to read the CCLA. I mean, I can't, I can't forward it along to our legal team for their review and give my notes on how I feel that it might go if I can't actually read it. Obviously, I'm going to have to be able to forward it along. I'm going to have to be able to have the person who signs this agreement be able to do so. That seems like a trivial thing to have to say, but just wait till the next slide. Um, and then, of course, once the agreement is signed, that agreement can cover, and hopefully would cover, all employees at our company who want to contribute to that project. We hope to not have to do a special, a single, a, a explicit agreement for each employee. That's a lot of work. As you might imagine, if you're working in a company that has, let's say, 20,000 employees around the world, which is roughly what we have, getting time on the calendar of the CTO or some other C-level executive in order for them to sign an agreement that they don't even understand is a non-trivial thing. I don't want to have to do that any more often than I have to. So I've been doing this now at my current employer for a little over four years. Uh, when I joined, we didn't have very much open source contribution going, so that was fun for me. I got to build all of this from the ground up. But that means, of course, I've been exposed to lots of different things that open source projects have chosen. And these are some examples. Some of these are really awesome. I've also forgotten many more than I put up here, which is probably because I didn't like them very much. But the first one is, goes back to that readability thing. I have literally gone to a project's website, clicked the link that says, click here to learn how to, to, to sign our con corporate contributor license agreement and ended up in Adobe Sign, which used to be called EchoSign, or DocuSign, looking at a third or fourth generation scanned copy of an agreement that's you know faxed and off-skewed and speckled and everything else. And it's like, 
really? They expect somebody at a big company to read this and sign it? That's not going to happen. Not only that, of course, I can't pull the text out and have our attorneys review it because it's not in a form that I can do that. I have seen projects that have individual contributor license agreements, but no corporate contributor license agreement. That's just a failure on their part to understand that the contribu contributions that they receive are not always going to be owned by individuals. In some cases, they are going to be owned by companies or other legal entities that are not people. Um, uh, let's see, I'll skip the other ones. Two, two, two. Oh, number two. That's the most fun one. I'm not going to name any names here because that's not fair. But um, there is a large group of projects that are open source projects that use very friendly open source licenses and are really fun projects to work on and we use many of them. And when you go to the project's source code repository and you look at the contributing file and it says, hey, if you want to learn about how to contribute to our project, click here, you land on their developer website, which requires you to log in to their social network in order to proceed to even find out what the terms of the agreement might be. You can imagine how much I'm willing to use my personal social network account, should I happen to have one on that network, in order to just review the terms of the agreement. You can imagine how much fun it would be when I went to the general counsel of our company and said, yeah, for you to return this, you're, you're going to have to also log into the social network in order to read. And then it gets a step further. The, the CTO has to sign this. So I have to have the CTO go log into the social network. This is clearly not, not useful. So I'm going to go quickly through the rest of these. Um, I'll take questions at the end. Um, I'll then go quickly through the rest of these because unlike good slides, I actually have lots of text on these. And I, uh, you can read all of these. And of course, they're on the FOSDEM website. It's actually where I'm presenting them from. So you're welcome to review them later. But these are the things that I need in order for me to be able to do my job well. And for me to do my job well means we get more contributions given to projects that want them which is, of course, what most open source projects want. So I need the text. I need it in a form that I can copy it around and hopefully not ever try to edit it, because that would not be fun, but um, to at least be able to copy it around. More importantly, it's, it's a document. It's like a piece of source code. Over time, it can change. People will be notified that maybe terms in the agreement might not apply the way they thought they did because they were drafted by a US lawyer, but the laws in the EU are different. And so maybe some additional terms need to be added or something needs to be changed. Or in cases where you have, uh, well, this I guess is true in the EU as well, where you have moral rights. If, the, if the, con the agreement does not contemplate those at all, there are some people who won't sign them because the agreement doesn't even say anything about moral rights and they want it explicitly stated. So over time, the agreement's going to change. You can imagine how much fun it is when I download the agreement, send it off to the legal team for review, that takes time. I mean, days, hopefully, maybe sometimes weeks, depending on how busy they are. Then I have to get scheduled time for it to get signed. When I bring it up for someone to sign it, I have to verify letter by letter that it is exactly the same as the one that we reviewed, because these documents never have version numbers. They don't have any way to know whether, they, whether there's been an intentional change or not, let alone an unintentional change. That's not good. <laughs> Um, the next thing, projects get told they need to have contributor license agreements. What most projects should do, like they do when they pick an open source license, they should go to the OSI website and say, look at all these licenses we have to pick, one, pick from. Let's pick one and use that. We've apparently, although not completely, but we've apparently gotten beyond the, and the next, the next major open source project is going to roll its own license. Those days were not fun. We're glad to be beyond them. We're not beyond them for contributor license agreements. Projects and companies behind them in some cases will just decide they're going to write their own. You can imagine then the legal team takes much longer to review them because they're completely new. They've never seen this before and they don't know what it might mean. I'm also not going to stress point two there, the second paragraph, although it is important for us. It may not be as so important for other companies. We choose not to contribute to projects where the contributor license agreement grants the project more permissions than it grants to its own users, which is called asymmetric licensing or inbound not equal to outbound or whatever you want to call it. There are other companies that will, but we generally do not. So if you are contemplating putting a contributor license agreement in place on your project and you are going to demand more rights from the contributors than you're then going to give to the people who get the software out from you, 
That may very well mean that some companies choose not to contribute to your project. So keep that in mind. This is going to seem silly because here we are in a room full of geeks doing all this wonderful thing, all these wonderful things that we do in 2017. And yet, the simplest and most reliable way to execute a con corporate contributor license agreement is literally by printing it out, getting someone to sign it, and then scanning that and emailing the result to whoever needs it. We are capable of using fax machines. I think I know where the one is on the floor that I work on, although I haven't probably touched it in two years. But I could if I had to. Um, it's unfortunate that this is the case, but this is the case. Um, there are also online platforms for doing signing of documents. I mentioned names of some earlier, and there are others. The problems with all of them is that they require the person who's looking at the document to be the person who's going to be signing it. That's not the case until you get to the very end of the process. There's at least two other people who are going to be reviewing the document. Um, I guess I just kind of covered that. I would also mention here, of course, that if you have taken my advice and put some sort of version number, or preferably even a content hash, uh, as a tag on your document, that when we go to sign it on the online execution platform, it should prominently present that same exact version number. So that if it turns out you have changed the document since we reviewed it, we'll at least know that you changed it. And then this is one that's important as well. We need to be able to add and remove people who have given and given permission under this agreement to contribute to your project. There are a variety of ways that's done. Some of them, it's by just sending an email to the pro one of the project leaders and saying, hey, add this person, and here's their GitHub or their account or their user email address or whatever that might be. In other cases, it's more, uh, let's say, more formal than that, and we actually have to sign a new copy of the contributor license agreement with a revised addendum at the end, which is kind of a pain. Um, I'll say that um, on the positive side, a couple of years ago, I started working with a company who did not have a corporate contributor license agreement at all. They had an individual one, but not a corporate one. And so we talked about what would be the easiest thing to do. We were actually already comfortable with the terms of the CLA they were using, but we needed a corporate version. And they didn't have a plan in place for how they were going to allow identifying of users who would be allowed to contribute. And I said, well, so your project's hosted on GitHub. That means that when we contribute to it, we're going to fork your project into our organization on GitHub. And then the pull requests that you receive are going to come from that repository. So if you're willing to just say, as long as the pull request originates from our fork of the repository, it's covered under the CCLA, I'm good with that. Because then I can just use GitHub's permission management to decide who has the ability to generate those pull requests and who doesn't. Worked out beautifully. I hope more projects choose to do that. Um, this is another interesting one, which that solves, but other mechanisms do not. There are some uh, foundations, I guess we'll say, that the only thing that they ask for and the only thing that they store in their database when you give them a list of contributors is the person's name. Not an email address, not any other identifier that you could be used to tie the contributions that are going to arrive to that person. Well, I suppose that could be OK if you have an incredibly unique name, although there's something like 7 billion people in the world, so no name is completely unique. But if you have a relatively common name, which I have run into, and let's say, for example, hypothetically, in the US, I had an employee named John Smith who wanted to contribute to one of these projects. How am I going to feel about putting the name Smith, John as a, a permitted contributor on the CCLA? How many John Smiths are then going to be able to potentially try to contribute under the auspices of my company, which I don't want them to be able to do? That's clearly not what we want. Uh, version updates, I mentioned before, we should have version numbers. If it turns out that you do need to revise your contributor license agreement, anyone who's already signed one should be told, hey, by the way, we've revised our contributor license agreement. Next time you come across this, you are going to see different terms. It would be really nice even, of course, to include a diff so we can just look and see what the change was. That is something that has uh, been a problem in the past as well. And then we also need consistency. We need to understand when you're going to require us to do this, when we're going to need to tell you who people are. There is uh, yet another unnamed, but people will know who they are quite easily, large formation with hundreds and hundreds of projects that has very well stated policies for when contributor license agreements are required. They're on their website. They've been there for years and years and years. They're easy to understand, and yet they're not followed. 
Many projects choose to do more relaxed versions of these policies because of all the complications I've been talking about. They don't want to have to do this for someone who's just going to send them one patch or two patches. We don't want that. And I'm going to skip through this. So for those of you in the audience who are software developers, this is what I want. I want to be able to come to your project and say, wow, this is almost exactly the same as I've seen 26 times before. Yes, there's little tiny details that are different, but that's what I want. And this is all because we actually do want to contribute to your projects. If you make it difficult for us, we won't be able to contribute to your projects, and you won't benefit, and we won't benefit. And that's that. I'm already being told my time is up, which of course was partly because of the laptop problems. But thank you very much. Um, I'm happy to take questions out in the hall when we're done here. Thanks.